scripture today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High God will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Merry Christmas. Before we reflect on that scripture that was read so beautifully by Kathy, would you turn your heart with mine in prayer? And as we get into the prayer, would you please clear some space in your own mind and heart? And to do that, let's, let's start a pattern of breathing together just to kind of calm the nerves and calm the busyness that this holiday is and just make space for God. Breathe in. Exhale. Gently breathe in and fill your lungs with air. Exhale all the air from your lungs. It's a cleansing breath. Breathe in the breath of God. God, we have gathered here on this holy morning to be a community formed, a community shaped, and a community devoted to you. We have come for a divine appointment with you, and we ask that in all that we do and all that we say and all that we reflect on together, that we meet you in the midst of it all. Whether anyone else knows it or not, you and I know, God, that without you, I can do nothing. So I pray that these words are helpful, that are true, and that they take root in our hearts in productive, life-giving ways. It is in the matchless name of your Son, our Savior, Christ the Lord, we pray, and God's people together say, Amen. This morning, I want to talk to you about finding meaning and making meaning. Now, I don't know if you've thought about it this way, but humans are animal creatures that make meaning and look for meaning. It's part of the kind of animal that we are. And in a religious sense, what we often mean by that is, we search out things called the sacred, or maybe you've used the word the holy. We search out somewhere in this world to get a sense of the something more that has a name, and that is divinity. We want to touch or see or connect with or find transformation from our connection to God. That's what we mean in a religious sense to find meaning. And to, to make meaning in a religious sense is to show up at places like this, churches, Hopefully, you're painfully aware of the fact that you are in a church. Our space, we wanted it to be designed that you wouldn't be mistaken about what it is. The place itself is communicating all around us a story, and it is supposed to illuminate the senses heavenward to a lift and enlighten the imagination up to the divine. But we also do things like practice a liturgy. Everything we've been doing this morning is liturgy. That's a, a $10 church word that means the work of the people. It's the prayers that we say, 
It's the forgiveness we ask. It's the, 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 for, the, we ask for the forgiveness given to each other. It's the sharing of communion. It's the hearing of the word. It's the receiving of the word. It's the passing of the peace. It's work that takes all of us to do. And in it, the intention is that we find ourselves formed and connected to God as we are formed by and connected to one another. But people aren't so religious these days. Yeah. You've noticed, you, you've been following the trends like I have. The church decline has been rampant for the last decade to two decades in America. It's been slow and steady. As Scott Galloway, the business professor at NYU, wrote about coronavirus, that coronavirus actually sped up every trend we saw before, and that sped up church decline as well. People are leaving the churches, leaving the pews. Why? Well, there's a lot of reasons. We could say that it's a sexual abuse scandal that many, many churches have perpetrated. A lot of abuse happens at church. Something that I think even if we've never done, we ought to repent of as a community because we are the church universal. And you can just go on Amazon Prime or Hulu or Netflix right now or HBO Max, whatever streaming service you want, and you can find no, do no less than a dozen documentary series on cult groups or groups where religious leaders exhibit control or place control over their followers and then the religious abuse follows and you can probably see a therapist's office full of people who've actually suffered from religious trauma it's terrible it's done in the name of our savior and that hurts the church but more to the point i think we've all entered into this era of time and have been entering into it for about a hundred years it was really pronounced in the 60s and it's coming in full now and it's called the age of secularity and in the age of secularity charles taylor the philosopher said it's not really an age where people don't have belief about mystery or the supernatural or religion it's just that what's motivating everybody or culture at large now more than anything else is the sense that we have to be our authentic selves we have to seek out ways to be ourselves regardless of whatever tradition we were a part of community we were a part of, religion we were a part of, or even culture that we were a part of. We are severing ourselves from uh, communities of authority of our life to make our own life, to make our own meaning, to say who we are, to stare into some sort of abyss and say, I am. Even Christians, without knowing it, act this way. I was um, in a golf shop the other day looking for Christmas presents, and I don't know if many of you know this or not, but... <clears throat> Since I've had my liver transplant, I am now on medications for the rest of my life to make sure that my body doesn't reject the liver. And a lot of those medications make me more susceptible to skin cancer. So I'm supposed to wear skin block, or sunblock wherever I go, which I'm not happy about because it's oily and I don't like it. And I didn't have to before. When I go golfing, I like to take off my cap and let a little sun on my face. I, I love that. That's not for me anymore. So I found myself kind of sheepishly walking over to the, to the wide brim hats at the golf shop. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I don't know if you know this. I'm 42. That's not cool for 42-year-olds to wear. So I was trying them on, and I felt really insecure about them, and I actually shared it on social media with people. I said, can I even pull this off? Everyone said I could totally pull it off. Everyone who said that was over 55. I'm not certain that I feel quite comfortable yet, but nevertheless, I texted a friend of mine who's a really avid golfer. He's a minister too, for that matter, and his response was, I don't know, bro, you do you. You do you. You know, that might work for hat choices. That might even work for sitting across somebody in a restaurant and talking about what you're going to order. You just do you, you know? But as an ethical impulse for society, I find it really wanting. Yet, the cultural milieu we swim in, even Christians buy into it without realizing it. It's kind of a you do you world. You do what you think's best. You do what expresses your in innermost self. You find whatever is of value on your own. We may not say it, but that's the pull of the world. Just watch any film, read any book, pay attention to how you speak and give advice. It happens everywhere. And so I'm convinced that people find meaning 
outside of the church. I think that people make meaning in places, and they're searching everywhere for it. Every uh, Memorial Day, I'm going to turn on social media, and I'm going to see the phenomenon of the gym as a church. You know, a gymnasium, a physical workout place. In fact, the New York Times had a had uh, several pieces this past spring on alternative churches, uh, communities of practice that mimic a church in their practices, whether people realize it or not, and, and they've become a false simulacra of the church. And gyms are one of them, especially people who participate in things like CrossFit. Oh, good. None of you are CrossFitters. Because it's really offensive to a CrossFitter to tell them that. CrossFit's very intense. I mean, it's super intense. And when you're there, it is clearly a community of discipline. That's kind of what the church is, a community where we hold each other up and we support one another. And we encourage each other onto good things, but they have mantras. They have things they say back and forth. It's like a shared liturgy. And every Memorial Day, I'm going to see on social media a gaggle of my friends who've taken on something of a, uh, what I call the CrossFit High Holy Holiday called the Murph Challenge. Have you seen the Murph Challenge? Well, it's in honor of a soldier named Murphy, I think. I can't really recall all the details, but I know it's an incredible challenge. People run like a couple miles with a weighted vest. They do a couple hundred pull-ups. They do a couple hundred burpees, and it is intense. And I watch these people with sweat pouring out, and at the end of all their journeying, and I don't know how they get photos of themselves doing the Murph as they're doing the Murph, but they're posting them. They look great, and they're running. And now they're at the gym, and it's, they have great pictures. I don't know how people get great sweaty pictures. I've never had a great sweaty picture. But there they are sitting there in the gym with their buddies. It might as well be Holy Communion, but it's, it's like muscle milk and creatine powder. And they're sitting around sharing and thinking about this thing that they just did and how hard it was. And the pictures show them with a sense of achievement. Oh, it's rapturous. And if you don't think that this is a rivaling meaning finding in a church just don't show up to church one Sunday and go see or go look at brunch places people find community everywhere right now we live in the age though I think that's it's just there's one name in this age that we live in and that's Taylor Swift how many Swifties are here today I'm putting my hand down you mean to tell me out of this crew none of you are Taylor Swift fans I don't buy it how is she a billionaire I don't buy it. Listen, the other day I was sitting in my brother's house on the sofa and my sister-in-law was across the room and into the kitchen. She was preparing some food for the kids. And I said, you know, this Taylor Swift thing. Now, she's been big for like over a decade, but like something happened. I don't know what it is. I can't figure it out. But she's been dating this professional football player, the great tight end for the Kansas City Chiefs, Travis Kelsey. And I said, she's even dating this Travis Kelsey. And my sister-in-law, without, without missing a beat, goes, if that's not a stunt for PR purposes, I don't know. And I go, what? A stunt for PR purposes. Why, why would Taylor Swift need any more good PR? She's a billionaire. She can say, go jump off a bridge, and people will jump off a bridge. She's the biggest thing since Michael Jackson. She's huge. And next thing you know, I'm in an actual debate with my sister-in-law about the merits of Taylor Swift in our society. If that's not funny to you, it is to me. I'm only confessing it here because this is church and this is where we confess our sins. And so my sister-in-law and I laughed about it, thinking, okay, we're in a little deep here. But this past week, and on my desk, I had a copy of The New Yorker and Christian Century, two different articles produced in two different places by two different authors who have children who took them both to Taylor Swift concerts, and they both wrote pieces called Going to the Church of Taylor Swift. She says it's like that showing up at this huge concert venue with all the other Swifties. It's like showing up to Easter service. You show up with other people who are strange like you because they believe in this thing that the world doesn't believe in. So there's solidarity. And if you don't realize this, shared physical action like standing or raising your hands or doing the sign of a cross or kneeling or shared physical actions like lifting weights and pull-ups and stuff, when you do those with other people, it is actually solidarity forming. It's in fact addictive. It is wonderful to do the same physical action as someone else. It is weird for your brain. And this is why people do the chicken dance at weddings. It's the only reason. Because we want to belong. Because there's no other reason to do that dance. None. So there they are. All singing the Taylor Swift lyrics. All raising their hands. All having this moment. And, and she said, they said, both authors said, it's not just the solidarity in the community. 
that they have in that three hours, its sense of transcendence is there. The sense of something more, this more thing, this meaning thing. Where does the transcendence come? Well, it's mediated through the fog machines and lights. I've been to some church services like that, haven't you? Yeah, I used, to, I used to be in a praise band at a contemporary church, and we used to joke every time we're going to change key, that's when we know the Holy Spirit shows up. Because whenever you're playing and the key changes, that's when everyone gets a little bit more emotional. It's like we don't realize the fact that music actually moves us. But boy, when that key changes, whew, people feel the juice even more. Well, I kid, but the reality is people feel that in these concerts. And both authors both said the church can learn something. And boy, what has the church missed out on? And I think to myself, shouldn't the church already have the market sort of cornered on community? And shouldn't it be per doing pretty well at mediating transcendence to people? If only we did things that touched the divine week in, week out. If only we gathered in places of glory and beauty. If only we had real community where, I don't know, you're with people who don't look like you, but you are asked to pass the peace with them. Well, that's enough of my high horse for today. But let me say this. I think you're looking for meaning because you're here on Christmas Eve morning at church. And still people show up to church looking for meaning. But you're wrong, and weird the church are wrong, if that meaning is for you tradition without life. We're wrong if what you're getting is belonging without believing. We're wrong if what it is is a, a club for you. We're wrong if all you're to buying into is in the institutionality of the church. We're right if we begin, begin to point to where the Gospels tell us to point. Did you hear it this morning in the reading? There was a great proclamation from an angel. An angel comes to Mary and says that she's going to bear a son, and that son is going to be the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one of God. Translation, the way I like to speak, this is the one who God's a new thing in the world will come through. God is going to do a new thing through this person called Jesus the Christ. And I want you to think about it. And tonight, as we reflect on this nativity that you can see emblazoned in this beautiful window, when we think about the situation of a mother and a father, who, by the way, let me point out to you, they are peasants, they are poor people, and they are unremarkable, and they're from an unremarkable town, and by the way, they live in a country where they have colonialists over them. They have a tyrannical government over them. They're not even home in their homeland. It's an unremarkable, unhappy, unwelcome situation to be in. And oh, by the way, they got to travel at full term. And oh, by the way, he's going to have a price on his head. And in no long time to follow, he's going to have to run for his life as an infant baby before he even understands that there is a price on his head. They are going to become political refugees. That's what they are. And they're going to become foreigners. This is not the place where you think you're going to have a divine connection. You're going to think you're going to have a divine connection in Hollywood or in Wall Street or at the king or at the foot of the queen. You think it's going to come in big, expected places, but it's come in the most unexpected of places because it's come to the most unremarkable place and the unremarkable time with an unremarkable person except for it's all remarkable. Isn't it remarkable that God went through the indignities of mammalian birth? Do you understand what that means for a second? There's a self-limiting nature of God, and God says, here's meaning for you. God steps into our flesh. God steps into our world. God became humanity so that humanity could become God. This is what the ancients would say. God steps into this mess, but he doesn't do it as a king. He doesn't do it fully fit, formed, and aged, and strong. No, no, he does it as a baby. Have you seen anything more worthless and useless than a baby? Human babies can't do anything. They come out of the womb completely needy. They're not like other mammal babies who can come out and walk. We do nothing. We are reliant upon our mamas. We cry when they go away. We have bad dreams. And by the way, when we don't feel well, we can't say we don't feel well. We scream and holler and we have need for our mamas. That's what babies are. Babies have object impermanence. So that means that God somehow in Christ mysteriously became flesh and there, right there, went through the indignity of object impermanence. When you take your rattle, when you take your binky, when you take your passy, I don't know what words you use, 
and you put it in front of your baby, they know it's there. When you take it away, they don't. How unremarkably remarkable is this? How meaningful is this? That God says, I'm going to come near you, and I'm going to come all the way. I'm not coming halfway to you. I'm taking it all on. I'm taking on all the lowest of you to lift you up. In the late modern age, in our late modern liberal age, I don't mean left liberal, I mean we're all uh, classic liberals in our world, right? In our late liberal age, we don't like authority. We don't. And I believe that right now what we see is just, we keep adding monsters to the throne, more and more authorities. Anytime we kind of come up to something, we feel like we deal with it, and we find another monster to dethrone as an authority. Here's a God who says, I am the authority, I am king. It's using first century language that doesn't make sense, no doubt, but kingly language is pretty, pretty authoritarian. Yet here's how God shows it. He comes as a peasant. He comes as a baby without any tool. And that's authority. Today, tonight, and as you go through these 12 days of Christmas, and yes, it is 12 days starting tomorrow, and you celebrate and you think about where meaning is found, look at that small little place in the world. Because if it's there, if God took on that flesh, and God takes us all on, and then I wonder where you're going to find the meaning. Perhaps as you look left and right in the eyes of your brothers and sisters and neighbors here, perhaps as you drive down the street and you see the person in the cold, perhaps as you sit at Christmas dinner, across from the person who voted differently than you and you cannot stand each other's point of view and you want to hate each other, but you realize that's a person and God has taken on personhood for them and for you. Meaning has come to us. It's come to us in the babe and it calls us all to make that meaning go with us wherever we go. Merry Christmas.